Happy Sabbath and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I believe Pastor Ray and I had this date set up several months ago. And uh, he asked me if I'd like to continue with it. And I said, sure, I'll do whatever the church would like me to do. So it's a privilege to be here with you this morning. I bring you greetings on behalf of our conference president, Elder Ed Keyes, and on behalf of our executive secretary, Jorge Ramirez. We've been meeting every Monday morning, either by Zoom or in person, making sure we uh, practice social distancing, being at least six feet apart and so forth, uh, to discuss some of the things that Pastor Ray's been talking about. How can we keep our conference moving forward? How can we keep the finances going? Um, several of our conferences here in the Pacific Union, which is the next higher organization above a conference, there's seven conferences in the Pacific Union, and several of those conferences have experienced significant downturns in giving. The Arizona Conference, praise God for your faithfulness as our members, the Arizona Conference is holding fairly steady. Now, we don't have April numbers in yet, but March numbers looked amazingly good for what our country is going through. One of the hats I wear in addition to treasurer is stewardship director. So oftentimes when I travel around the conference to speak, you hear a stewardship sermon. That's not going to be the case this morning. However, I do want to give you a challenge from the stewardship department as we begin our time together here this morning. Recently, we've been living in these times that have been described in a number of different ways. Unprecedented, uncertain, unusual, challenging, changing times. All of these descriptors are either partly or mostly true. The reality is that most of us don't do very well when we experience change. Whether that change is in our health, change in our job status, a change in our family relationships, a change in uncertainty about the future. No matter what type of change, it's difficult to deal with. So these unprecedented times can cause stress, anxiety, and fear. However, as Christian stewards, we can look at things in a more bright and hopeful manner. Stewards manage things for an owner. And as Christian stewards, from a Christian perspective, we believe that the owner is God, our Father. So as long as we're doing our best as a steward to manage what God has given us, God's resources, not ours, we can leave the stress, anxiety, and worry to those who don't yet have a hope. Not yet. It's our job to share it. They don't yet have a hope of eternal life to come. So how should we handle our finances during these changing and uncertain times? I would encourage faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2 says, Moreover, it's required of stewards that one be found faithful. How can we do that in practical terms? While many are hoarding food, toilet paper, and other supplies, we can continue to being faithful in our tithes and offerings. Not reducing our giving so that we can acquire more goods and, and make our short-term future more certain, but rather increasing our giving to show where our hearts truly are. Because you see, our hearts follow our treasures. Your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. I recently attended a meeting of the Planned Giving Roundtable of Arizona. I attended by Zoom, of course, as Pastor Ray explained. This is an organization where fundraisers of different charities meet to discuss best practices. Most of them are non-Christian charities. However, I heard words of encouragement and hope, even from these secular organizations. Now, I've read a study that shows that about one-fourth of us here, in, in, this whole thing has caused financial hardship on all of us. But I've read a study that shows that about one-fourth of Americans have experienced very little or no financial hardship. Maybe they're on a fixed income or they've got something going on where their income continues to flow in unchecked about another fourth have experienced very little or not that much financial hardship due to the COVID virus. The other half of us have been experienced quite a lot or to a devastating effect. But here's the challenge. 
one of our charities offered this great suggestion. Why not consider doing good with your stimulus check? So the government, as you may know, has promised that most of us will receive either $1,200 or $2,400 if you're a couple as a stimulus check. Why not do good with that stimulus check that will soon hit your account? Now, obviously, faithful stewards will pay a faithful tithe on that additional income. But maybe the half of us who have not been affected that much, or not at all, could do something really radical. Give it all away. You weren't expecting those funds two months ago. It's really a financial windfall if you're not experiencing much hardship. So you wouldn't be worse off without it, would you? So you could do something to help others. I would challenge you to read Matthew 25, 35 to 40 and see what Jesus says about those who help others. Give some of it to support a local business that's hurting. But then consider using most of it to grow the kingdom. Give some here to your home church, the Tempe Church. Give some to one of our Adventist schools, such as Thunderbird Adventist Academy. Give some to our Arizona Advance, which goes for evangelism, Camp Yava Pines, and education. Or perhaps return a double tithe. You see, those of us who have a hope for an eternal future shouldn't allow the stress, anxiety, and fear to overwhelm us. If our eyes are truly focused on God, we have nothing to fear. God is in control. He's still in control. He has led us in the past. He will continue to lead us. And ultimately, we're looking forward to the most unprecedented event in Earth's history, Jesus' second coming. So let's be radical in our giving at this time where we're so close to the end. That's the stewardship challenge for you today, and I just ask that you'll prayerfully consider what you can do to keep our ministries moving forward. I'd like to pause for one more word of prayer as we open up the message for this morning. Father in heaven, it's a privilege to worship on this Sabbath day, and Lord, we just pray for your spirit to be here in this church, and more importantly, to be in each home where people are watching this service this morning. Lord, may you open our minds and hearts to the words that you have for us today. And Lord, I ask that you'll speak through me and that you will speak in spite of me in my sinfulness. We thank you for covering each of us with your robe of righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. So our topic this morning is what God cannot do. Is there anything that God can't do? As creator of the universe, God can do anything and everything, right? As a kid, I thought it would be great when I grew up. I thought, I'll be able, able to do whatever I choose to do. I won't have to obey my parents. I won't have to do my chores. I can be my own boss. And then everything will be great. But you know, as I've matured, I've realized that even if you're the boss, the owner of your own company, you have things that you have to do and you've got people counting on you. Even if you're the President of the United States, you don't get to choose your agenda each and every day. People are trusting you to make important decisions that affect their lives and well-being. And even if you're the God of the universe, there must be an order to the way things happen and operate. All who believe in God are trusting Him for everything in life. So is there anything that God can't do? This morning I'm going to share with you two things that God cannot do. First of all, a principle. To have a healthy relationship, there must be trust. Trust between a parent and a child, between a teacher and a student, between a husband and wife, between friends, between roommates, between boss and employee. All successful relationships have the necessary ingredient of trust. So to have a relationship with God, we must trust Him, right? But is He trustworthy? I would like to share with you three stories this morning of why you can know that God is trustworthy and you can trust Him with your life and with your future. 
Now, Jesus often used parables and stories to illustrate the points that he was making. And this morning, I'm going to share these three stories with you. The first one comes from a book that I read called, um, uh, just slipped my mind, uh, The Peace Child. A book called The Peace Child that was written, I believe, back in the 70s. Don Richardson was a missionary who went to New Guinea, New Guinea in the 60s. He was a pioneer missionary in New Guinea among the Sawi people. Richardson had to trust God completely because the Sawis weren't just heathen. They were known to be cannibalistic and headhunters. Living among them in virtual isolation from the modern world involved exposure to disease as well as the constant threat of violence. In their jungle home, the Richardsons, he took his wife and his son with him, set about learning the native Sawi language, which was very complex. Don wanted to integrate into the culture as much as possible so that he could find a way to introduce Jesus to this tribe of people. However, as he was learning the language and living with the people, he became more aware of the worldview gulf that separated his Christian view from the view of the Sawis. In their eyes, Judas, not Jesus, was the hero of this gospel story. Jesus was just the dupe to be laughed at. Because you see, in the Sawi culture, treachery was a valued trait. As the Sawi told stories to their children around the campfire at night, the hero was the one who formed friendship with the express purpose of later betraying that friendship. It was the highest honor to kill the befriended one to be eaten. Sawis even had an, an expression for this practice. It was called to fatten him with friendship for an unexpected slaughter. You see, for the Sawi to kill somebody in the early stage of friendship, well, that was just a commonplace murder. But for them to develop the friendship over time, to draw the person into their own village, into their own longhouse, and to create this friendship to that level, that called for some special sophistication in treachery. And it made the perpetrator the hero of the Sawi culture. The only answer to this treacherous murder to the victim's village was to plan revenge and how to kill somebody from the other village. Well, through the complexities of their culture, the Sawis realized that they couldn't intermarry too much, so daughters often married into a different tribe or a different village. Um, but the cycle of treachery and betrayal continued for generation after generation. How was Richardson going to find a way to share Jesus and overcome this idealization of treachery. Richardson tried the traditional ways of telling the story of Jesus. But to his chagrin, Jesus, Judas again came out as the hero, someone who had wormed his way into the inner circle and had remained close to Jesus for three years. And even unsuspected by the other 11 disciples, he had then betrayed Jesus. In their culture, that was the ultimate heroism. Later, Richardson tried peace talks when the hostilities escalated between the neighboring villages. However, he soon realized the futility of the term peace because peace requires trust. It requires the assurance of goodwill on both sides. And among the Sawis, the philosophy ingrained since childhood was to use supposed friendship as a means for treachery. When treachery is philosophically justified, true peace is almost impossible. Finally, in desperation, Richardson met with the leaders. The leaders of the warring tribes. You see, Richardson had built his hut on the edge of a clearing. And because of the medicine and tools that he had available, the tribes moved into each side of the clearing so that they could be near this white man who was helping them so much. Richardson met with the leaders of the warring tribes and he told them that he and his wife would have to leave and move away so that they could move back into jungle in isolation from each other because there was constant fighting happening there in the clearing and even occasional bloodshed. The tribal leaders realized that if the missionary left that he would take with him the much needed medicine and tools that they were becoming reliant on. 
After much talk among themselves, they came back to Richardson the next day and begged him not to leave. We will make peace tomorrow, they said. Richardson woke the next morning wondering what could bring peace to these villages. He saw both of the villages, one of them gathering on one side of the clearing and the other on the other side. Finally, one of the elders picked up a baby boy and started across the clearing. But immediately his wife came screaming out of the crowd, grabbed the baby, and ran back to her hut. The unease and tension just ratcheted up on both sides of the clearing. Soon another man picked up one of his children and started across the clearing. But again, the family members shouted their displeasure and their horror, and it caused him to turn around and go back. Then, because Richardson was off to the side and standing on his porch, he saw something out of the corner of his eye. One of the very young men, a young father, was sneaking back to his hut. His wife was in the midst of the tumult there at the edge of the clearing. And before anyone noticed what he was up to, he picked up his only child out of the hut and raced down the steps and sprinted across the clearing. His wife noticed too late what was happening. She tried to chase after him, but in her haste, she fell off the edge of the path and into the bog of mud. She cried and screamed as she saw Caillou, her husband, walk up to the respected elder of the other tribe. Caillou asked the elder, Will you plead the words of peace among your people? Yes, I will plead the words of peace, the elder replied. Then I give you my son, and with him my name. Caillou held forth his only son, and the elder received him gently into his arms. The elder then shouted, It is enough! I will surely plead peace among my people. And both villages erupted in emotion. Suddenly another villager appeared beside Caillou, holding one of his baby sons, and cried, Caillou, will you plead peace among your people? Yes, Caillou responded, holding out his arms. Then I give you my son, and with him my name. And Caillou departed back to his own side of the clearing with a different child. There was a mixture of tears and sobs from close relatives on both sides. As Caillou left, the village elder shouted an invitation to all of his people. Those who accept this child as a basis for peace, come lay hands on him. Richardson was astounded. He couldn't understand what had just happened. And he asked a young man standing near to him, what is going on? The young man replied, Caillou has given his son to the other village as a peace child. And in return, our enemies have given a peace child to us. Well, why is this necessary? Richardson asked. Well, missionary, you've been urging us to make cheap peace. Don't you know it's impossible to make peace without a peace child? The atmosphere of war suddenly vaporized and evaporated, and Richardson realized that he had been given the key for reaching the Sali people. Everyone who placed his hands on one of those peace child babies had pledged their goodwill, their credibility, and their trust toward making peace with the enemy. And Caillou was now the most trusted man of the village, the adjudicator of all disputes. If a man would actually give his own son to the enemy, that man could be trusted. He had invested his only son to make peace, so the tribesmen trusted him to do what was right. Richardson's picture of the culture, totally based on violence and treachery, evaporated. And he realized now he had a new angle to share the gospel story with the tribe. Like Caillou, God had only one son to give. And like Caillou, God gave his son to the earth as a peace child. The analogy of God's sacrifice of his own son as the peace child to our world became an overwhelming and persuasive way of teaching the gospel. As a result, many villagers converted to Christianity. It's a powerful story. I'm sure you can find the book on Amazon, The Peace Child. But as I read that story, it haunted me. It haunted me because I realized that betrayal isn't just something that happened in New Guinea in the 1960s. Betrayal is universal. We've all been victimized by having someone we trust 
turn on us or not follow through with a promise or betray us. We do it even to the ones we love the most. Sometimes the ones we love the most are the ones we hurt more than just our casual acquaintances. It even happens in the church. In the church, we have control issues that cause us to betray our fellow believers. You know, control issues are about 90% of the problems we have in our church. And if we would just realize that the church is God's church and not my church to control, many of those issues would evaporate and go away. But we say unkind words to someone. We bully someone. We form cliques. We exclude people. We don't pay attention to those who are lonely. We cannibalize someone with our words, someone who thought they could trust us. Story number two. When I was in college, I fell for a girl. I fell in love and I fell hard. And this wasn't puppy, puppy love because I'd already experienced that in high school. So I just knew this had to be the real thing. It started out as a casual friendship, just hanging out together toward the end of the school year. As we hung out more often, a solid friendship developed. We would talk in the cafeteria when we saw each other. We started looking to sit with one another at mealtime. And then it progressed to finding each other during our mutual free time between classes so that we could talk and hang out and share stories. The grass was warm, the sunshine was shining down on us, spring was in the air, and in my mind, love was in the air. We weren't officially dating, but we promised to keep in touch over the summer. And I even took her home and spent a couple days with her family on my way home. Now, as I was leaving, she mentioned that months ago, she had promised to go to Disneyland with her friend Scott because they had both graduated. and They wanted to go to grad night at D Disneyland together. So even though she said her heart was mine, she felt she needed to keep this promise with Scott. I thought, okay, you've heard the old adage, if you love something, let it go, and if it's meant to be, it'll come back to you, right? Well, we started a letter writing blitz that summer, back and forth a couple times a week. Now remember, that was before cell phones and texting and all this instant messaging stuff. I would anxiously walk to the mailbox when I got home from work and my heart would leap when I would see an envelope there with her handwriting on it. This was back in the days where you had to actually use paper and pens and envelopes and stamps. And as I would open up the envelope, I would smell her perfume wafting out on the paper. You see, back in the old days, communication involved more than just eyesight and thumbs. So in addition to writing, we began calling each other on the phone. And again, this was before cell phones. So I was paying long distance fees for every phone call. In fact, it was before wireless phones. I had to take the phone in the hallway and stretch the cord as far as it would go to get in my bedroom and close the door for a bit of privacy. This became quite expensive talking on the phone a couple times a week for an hour at a time. In fact, by the end of the summer, I figured out that if I hadn't spent all that money on long distance phone calls, I could have probably flown out to see her or flown her out to see me. But anyway, the long distance relationship was blooming. The letters were intensifying in their mushiness and the phone calls were ending with I love you's. We were making plans to see each other again at the very end of the summer. She found that she had a friend who needed to drive a car from California where she lived to Colorado where I lived about a thousand mile trip. And she thought she could catch a ride with her friend to come visit me and meet my family. What a thrill, I was so excited. I would get to see the girl of my dreams, the girl I was in love with very soon. The anticipation of seeing her fueled my energy through each long day at work in the hot sun, doing concrete work and masonry work and all these construction things I was doing with my dad. I couldn't wait to see her again, to hold her, to hug her, to smell that perfume in person. As the days got closer, I was still writing every other day and calling twice a week, but inexplicably, the letters from her were coming less frequently. The phone calls were shorter. The goodbyes were less expressive. 
deep in the recesses of my mind, something didn't seem quite right. But love is blind, and my mind ignored these subtle changes. I was just so excited that I was going to get to see my girl. Soon it was the week of the planned reunion. We talked on the phone again on Thursday night. I'm coming on Sunday, she said. We're driving out all in one day. After we get to Denver, my friend said, I can use the car to come on up to your house. I can stay for Sunday night and all day Monday, but we're going back on Tuesday. Great, I said. I'll ask my boss, my dad, if I can have Monday off. Give me any necessary progress on your trip. All day Sunday, I was a nervous wreck of anticipation. Day turned into evening, evening turned into night, and finally I got a phone call late that night. We got a really late start, she said, and we're now taking two days to drive out. I'll be there Monday afternoon, but I still have to leave Tuesday. Monday afternoon, I got another phone call. Well, we're here in Denver, but I'm just too tired to drive on up to your house. What? I questioned. You just drove 17 hours and you can't drive one more hour to see me? No, I don't have the energy, she replied. Well, I'll hop in my car. I'll drive down to Denver to come see you. No, it's not just the driving. I just don't have the energy for this relationship anymore, she said. And finally, the truth came out. While she had been writing me love letters and talking on the phone all summer, She'd also been regularly dating Scott all summer. And the reality of seeing me as it came closer into focus, she finally realized she couldn't keep up this charade of duplicity. I was heartbroken. I had invested a lot of emotional energy all summer long, only to find out it was a sham, a fake, a betrayal. Jeremiah 17:9. The heart is deceitful above all else and beyond cure. Who can understand it? It's even there in the Bible. This betrayal thing is universal. The implications are chilling. You can't trust people. You can't trust them because, as Jeremiah says, the hearts are deceitful. You also can't trust people because they change. I'm quite sure that my girlfriend did love me at least a little bit, when I dropped her off at her house at the beginning of the summer. But love the one you're with became her mantra. Scott was right there in California. I was a thousand miles away. Even more chilling, though, is we can't understand our own hearts. Have you ever made a promise that you didn't keep? Have you ever gone back on your word or not followed through on keeping an appointment with a friend? Our hearts are more deceitful than anything else in the universe. And we continually surprise ourselves by thinking or doing things we would not normally think or do. Paul confirms this when he says in Romans 7, 19, For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. And consider Jesus' disciples the people closest to Christ while he was here on earth. Surely they were trustworthy, right? Well, with the exception of Judas, we already talked about Judas, but the other 11 must have been trustworthy, right? Consider this story in Matthew 26, verses 31 to 35. It tells us about the disciples' betrayal. Jesus, you will all forsake me tonight. Peter, even if everyone else forsakes you, I won't. Jesus, tonight you will deny me three times. Peter, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the disciples said the same. It's the pattern of our life. We pledge our love and our faithfulness. Then we let others and ourselves down. Our deceitful heart betrays others, and even more so, our deceitful heart betrays us over and over again. So if our hearts aren't trustworthy, how can we then know that God is trustworthy? The answer is found in two things that God cannot do and something that we as humans don't understand. The first thing that God cannot do, 
God cannot stop loving us. He loves us fully, completely, unconditionally. He loves us at all times and in all circumstances. 1 John 4, verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. For emphasis, John repeats the concept again in the same chapter. Down in verse 16. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. So the first thing is, God is love. Love is not so much what God does, as it is who God is. It is the condition of his being the basis of his character. Knowing that God is love, however, is not sufficient for us to trust him. Because one can choose to love today and then choose not to love tomorrow. Our human experience teaches us that. My experience with my girlfriend in college taught me that. But knowing that God is love makes him trustworthy because every act is founded in perfect love. You see, God, unlike us, doesn't wrestle with whether to love us. Unlike my girlfriend, he doesn't have to choose whether to love me or to love Scott. He does not decide to love us. He loves us fully and completely because that's his nature. He is God, and God is love. So the first thing that God cannot do, God cannot stop loving us. The second thing... God cannot change. This also makes him trustworthy. If he was loved today and something else tomorrow, we couldn't depend on him. But he is love, and he does not change. Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. Numbers 23.19, God is not human that he should lie, nor a human being that he should change his mind. God's love is so amazing and so different from ours, that it's beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension. My grandfather was a pastor in the Wyoming conference years ago, and my mom tells me that in Little Lander, Wyoming, they had a huge youth group in that little town, and that youth group was so active, and they, they liked each other, they enjoyed doing things together. And one of the main reasons my grandfather's ministry attracted youth is because each and every Sabbath, my mom tells me, he preached on the love of God. We've already proven that we can't understand our own deceitful hearts. Our sinful nature ensures that we're deceitful even to ourselves. But beyond understanding our own heart, we as humans don't fully understand God's heart. And that brings us to our text that Pastor Ray read this morning. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. And I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Because God is love, and because God cannot change, there's two things that we can't do. First of all, there's nothing that we can do to cause God to love us more than he already does. It's not a merit system. We can't earn more love from God. God doesn't love us because of what we do. He loves us because he is God. The second thing, and this is an important one, because too many of us carry around a huge burden of guilt. There's nothing that we can do to cause God to love us any less than he already does. God loves us fully and unconditionally at all times and in all circumstances. Not so much because he chooses to, but because his character is love. God, who is love, wants us to understand how he feels when we don't trust his love. So story number three. Dr. David Smith was president of Union College and then pastor at Southern University and now president of Southern University. And he graciously shared with me these theological concepts 
and also shared the following illustration, which he gave me permission to use, that gives us a small glimpse into how God must feel when we don't trust him. Because of certain family dynamics, David spent many hours of his childhood and youth in his grandfather's home, under his grandfather's care, helping his grandfather around the house and yard, and he spent many happy hours and days being loved by his grandpa. So David was very close to his grandpa and loved him very much. In their adult years, the situations were reversed, which gave David a chance to repay the kindness of his grandfather. David, his wife, and his two young daughters were living at one of our Adventist academies, where David was the English teacher. Grandpa needed a place to live, and David's wife graciously agreed that it would be a good idea to invite Grandpa to move into their house. This turned out to be a wonderful arrangement for all of them. David had ample opportunity to visit with his beloved grandfather. The great-granddaughters had a chance to get to know and learn from Grandpa, as David had. And Grandpa was in a loving family environment and feeling useful as he would help take care of the yard and the garden for David. All was well. One evening, David came home from class and walked into the house. Now, as he entered the house, he could look straight through the living room and the dining room and right out into the backyard through the sliding glass door. He would often come home and see Grandpa out there working in the yard and in the garden, and today was no different. However, as David walked through the living room and into the dining room, his eye was drawn to something he hadn't seen before. Right there in the middle of the sliding glass door was a hole, and it looked like it was probably a BB gun-sized pellet hole. Now, this unexpected development upset David quite a bit. After all, this was a rented house. How was he going to explain this damage to the landlord? And more importantly, how was he going to, on a teacher's salary, afford to repair or likely replace that expensive glass door? So being an academy teacher, David decided he would get right to the bottom of this situation by starting some interrogations. Now David did, in fact, have a BB gun in the house, and occasionally he or Grandpa would get that gun out and use it to chase the squirrels or the birds away from the garden in the backyard. So his first thought was to find out if Grandpa knew anything about the hole or if Grandpa had used the BB gun. So David walked in the backyard where Grandpa was working and said, Hi, Grandpa. How are you doing this afternoon? The yard is looking immaculate as usual, and all the vegetables look like they're growing and ripening and getting almost ready for harvest. And then he switched to his surprise question. Grandpa, do you know anything about that hole in the back door? No, Grandpa said slowly. I don't know anything. Didn't know there was a hole in the door. Well, have you used the BB gun lately? David persisted. No, I haven't had it out all week, Grandpa replied as he continued hoeing weeds without looking up. David thought, this behavior is a bit unusual. Grandpa is usually more than conversational, and he's often looking for an excuse to kind of lean on that hoe for a while. But tonight, Grandpa just kept on working. So David asked himself, well, who else might know something about this? Perhaps the girls know. Now, the girls were six and four years old and had often been warned by their mother not to even touch the BB gun on threat of, you'll shoot your eye out. But you never know about kids, right? Remember, the heart is deceitful, and kids' hearts sometimes seem to be even more deceitful as they're growing up to learn the difference between right and wrong. So David went and found the girls, and being a former boys' dean, he knew all the best interrogation techniques. So he brought them out to the dining room table and set them down on chairs facing the glass door at the scene of the crime. However, he continued to stand up and tower over them in an intimidating posture. And he also knew the best technique for going for an immediate confession. So he asked both girls while pointing at the hole in the door, which one of you shot a hole with the BB gun in the back door? In response, they both just pointed to their eyes and shook their heads back and forth. As in, the evidence speaks for itself, right? 
If we had used the BB gun, we wouldn't have eyes. David even went to the length of accusing his wife when she got home. She said, are you crazy? I hate that BB gun. I don't even want it in my house. Why would I so much as touch that gun, let alone shoot a hole in the back door? So the mystery remained unsolved. The door eventually was replaced, and David pretty much forgot about the incident. Several weeks later one evening, he was walking down the hallway past Grandpa's home. The door was slightly open, and he stuck his head in and said, Grandpa, how are you doing? I've been so busy, and we haven't had much time to talk lately. How are things going for you? Are you still enjoying living here with us in our house? Grandpa said, David, come in and sit down. I need to talk to you, son. I need to tell you something that's been on my mind for some time now. So David went in the room and sat down. Grandpa shared his story, and David was shocked and surprised when Grandpa confessed to shooting the hole in the back door. He asked, Grandpa, why wouldn't you just tell me the truth that afternoon when I asked you? Why did you think you needed to hide this from me? And Grandpa's reply stunned him even more. David, I thought that you would make me leave your house. I thought I wouldn't be able to stay here in your home if I told you I put a hole in the door. I love it here. I don't want to leave your home. Oh, Grandpa, David replied, there's nothing you could do, nothing you could say that would cause me to love you any less than I do. We want you to live with us for as long as you can. You don't ever have to worry that your deeds or actions or even your words are going to cause us to change our love for you, Grandpa. We will always love you. Friends, God wants us in his house with him. God is love, and love wants us in God's house. There's nothing that we can do to change God's love for us. There's nothing we can do to earn more love. And there's nothing we can do to drive love away. Furthermore, we don't have to wait until we are good enough to come to love's house. God is inviting you to come to love's house today. All you have to do is accept his gifts. And this is the promise that he's promised us, 1 John 2.25. This is the promise that he's promised us, eternal life. All we have to do, friends, is accept God's gift of love, to accept his gift of forgiveness, his gift of mercy, his gift of grace, his gift of love, his gift of eternal life. God wants each and every one of us to live in his house of love with him for eternity. Won't you say yes today? Won't you trust God and accept his free gift of love and eternal life? May God be praised for his eternal, everlasting love.